been doing this evening? Yes. Yes. All right. Can I have some, some already converted Christians up in here tonight? Any Christians in here tonight? Yes, sir. I got a couple of you. You want to worship the Lord with me tonight? Yes, sir. All right. How about I say, worthy is the Lamb. Holy, holy, holy. You like that one? Yeah. Can you handle that one? And uh, look, you can worship however you want. If you want to sing along, sing along. If you just want to use this time to pray, pray. If you want to get on your knees there in your, in your little pew, get on your knees there. If you want to come up here, pretend this is the altar and just get right with the Lord or just praise Him or shed some tears to Him, confess your sins, you just worship. You have freedom to worship how you want. But how do you feel led to Yeah. 
just come to you tonight. God asking that you would meet with us. That you would be here, Lord. That your presence would fall in this place tonight. In a manifest way. We know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I know so many men in here tonight are not free. And they need you, Lord. Father, would you protect us from the enemy, his lies, his distractions. God, have your way. Move mightily, despite me, a sinner, but in Christ, a saint. Lord, despite all our shortcomings, Lord, help us to humble ourselves before you, a holy and righteous King, a loving Father. God, that you may get glory to me the enemy may tremble at the word you hear yeah. tonight. Please, Lord, let the enemy tremble. That your angels may rejoice, Lord, that even the one uh, of the flock that you went out to find, you found. May you find the one tonight amongst us, Lord. Speak to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
There's nothing worth all that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're leaving her. Tasted sweetest of life where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence. Love, yeah. Holy Spirit, you are.
Larry Pillow would say, well, glory. Well, glory. <laughs> so, my dad was supposed to be here tonight. And he and my mother went on a little vacation. My uh, big brother, Jason, had uh, brain cancer. And uh, he died last year. His birthday is on the 27th, Thanksgiving. So today's his birthday. Amen. And so they went on a vacation just to get alone and have some time to reflect and love on each other and support one another. And um, he actually died on the 28th last year, the day after his birthday. So he got to make it, make it to his last birthday. But um, he was going to be here tonight, and I was going to do the music part, and then uh, he was going to do the speaking, but because they went out of town, I think he intentionally threw me under the bus because he, he, he likes me to, to preach. And so he, he was like, we need to get you in up there at Calvary Rescue Mission preaching. I'm like, oh, I'm good. You know, I'm doing the music. That's fine. And then all of a sudden he said, hey, I need you to uh, fill in for me because I'm going to be gone, you know. So, um, so that's, that's why I'm going to be speaking with you tonight. Um, but before we get into it, uh, I would like to go to Lord in prayer because I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know what I'm going to be saying to you yet. I've uh, prayed about it some. I've asked the Lord to lead me. I've got uh, took, took some uh, scripture verses down that uh, came to my mind. But uh, I'm going to be just excited to hear what's coming out of my mouth tonight as I hope you are. Because I'm not sure what it's going to be yet. But uh, I believe it's going to be from the Lord. Uh, before, before I pray for us, uh, I would like to take prayer requests. In fact, let me grab a pen real quick because um, I like to engage with people. Thank you. I like to interact. Uh, one of the things today that, that I don't like so much about the American church is the fact that it's designed for the most part. Well, I'll have an extra card. Might need it. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's designed in large part for a group of people to come into a room, listen to some band, play songs for 30 minutes, sing along to some lyrics on a stage, and then listen to some guy speak for 30 minutes and then leave. There's, there's very little sense of family or community or oneness. Um, there's very little sense of engagement or accountability, um, which I think, I think that, that I may know what I'm going to be talking on tonight since that's coming out of my mouth right now. But um, I just want to start um, by letting you know that the Lord loves you. He's a good, good daddy. He's the best. And the reason many of us are miserable is because we're not doing what daddy told us to do. We're running off, being idiots, doing our own thing, thinking we know better than the one who made us, and just making a big old mess out of stuff. I know I did it for many, many years. I know I look young, but I'm 42. I've been shot in the chest with a 9 millimeter point blank range. I've jumped out of airplanes. I've toured all across this country with rock stars. Been there and done that. And um, it's only by the grace of God I don't look like I've been there and done that. But um, I know that uh, this, this world's a tough place. And uh, I want to pray for you by name and specifically what you may need. So please raise your hands if you have any prayer requests. Yes, sir. In the blue shirt. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I'd like to request the meeting. William? Uh, Wendell. Wendell. Yeah. How can I be praying for you, sir? Uh, to keep the evil spirit away from my good spirit. Okay. Protection from the enemy. Yeah. And, Wendell, I want to give you a word on that. Um, I'm going to pray for that for you, but I also want to encourage you with this word from Scripture that says, greater is he who lives in you than he who lives in the world. So if you've got the Spirit of God in you, see, a lot of times we fall to defeat because we are not believing the word and standing on the promises of God, right? When We, we always hear this, well, you, if you want to be saved, you need to believe in Jesus, right? And we think, when we think that, we think of a guy who, who walked the earth 2,000 years ago in human flesh, and that's true. But, you know, today we don't have the flesh version of Jesus. We have the written version of Jesus. Because Jesus was not only a man in human flesh, he was also the Word that became flesh 
But before he put on that flesh, he was just the Word. So my point to you is to believe in Christ means more than to believe in just the person that lived 2,000 years ago. It means to believe the Word. And the Word, if you really believe in Jesus, and the Word says, hey, greater is he who lives in you than he who is in the world. When you start getting under attack by the enemy, and he's putting the lies in your head, and he's stirring up negative emotions, you have a choice. To believe how you feel, to believe your circumstances, to believe the lies, or to believe Jesus. And what we choose to believe will dictate ultimately how we end up feeling and how we end up behaving. Because how we think determines how we end up feeling and behaving. Does that make sense? So you got it, brother. You just stand on the Word. Stand on the Word. Uh, who else? I know I saw a couple of other hands. Yes, sir. What's her name, Michael? Her name is Bridget. Bridget. How can I be praying for Bridget, Michael? Is she? Does she know the Lord? She always asks me to pray for her. Okay. So, you know, I just want to pray her strength in the Lord. Okay. I got you. I got you. Yes, sir. Like what after my grandchildren. Okay. And also my girl grandchildren. It's a lot of peer pressure out there. Mm. Come to find out that sometimes my grandchildren are the perpetrators. Yeah. So these guys know the Bible. They they follow their scripture. They're stupid. Yeah. But still, that 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 uh, influence is out there in the world is strong. Yes, sir. And you see it in their behavior. Yes, sir. Absolutely. But for prayer. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, sir. You know what's up about the sun has already been done. The That's right. The future and the future is the past. You're gonna have to repeat yourself. What happened all the way back to the, before Christ BC? It's already been done in, 19, in 2017. No difference. No, what's real? What I see, you know, I remember I read in Psalms that old Saul, which he was the king and thing, he had jealousy. And saw crew. Yeah. Then I read Psalm 70. It says, David said, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Let them be ashamed that confound me, that seeks after my soul. Let them be turned backwards and put to confusion that divides my hurt. Let them be turned back for a reward of their shame. And it says, ah, ha, ha, ha. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. <laughs> and let such as love thou salvation set them to us. Oh, let God be magnified. Amen. I am poor and needy. Make haste to me, O God. Thou art my help. And my deliverer. Oh Lord, please do not delay. Amen. 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 He, he prayed his own prayer right there. That's what I'm talking about. Yes, I saw no, Yes, sir. <coughs> Say again. Ronnie. Ronnie. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a struggling alcoholic. Okay. And I'd like to pray for me to try and help with it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You got it, brother. Anyone else? Yes, sir. My name is Willie Townsend. Willie. I would like you to pray for my beautiful daughter. Uh, she, she's uh, 14 years old. She lives in Atlanta. And I, I'm going to visit her uh, for the for holidays. I pray that uh, God will protect her and shield her uh, against all harm. Okay. <laughs> What's her name? Awesome. Anyone? Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Terrence, and I want you to pray for me that I make it to this discipleship class. Got one more phase going to do. I'm going to try to make it on through this. Yes, sir. Let's just lift up each and every man who hasn't raised his hand tonight. Amen. 
That's right. I know that's right. Anyone else in particular? Yes, sir. I got you. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. I understand. Okay, you got it, Dale. You got it. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anyone else? All right, if you guys would bow your heads, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, O oh, Creator of the universe, we we come before You, Lord, knowing that we are unworthy sinners in need of a great Savior. Lord, we ask that You would forgive us of our sins and give us hearts and minds of total repentance, Lord, that we would hate evil and love righteousness. God, that the, the sins that used to bring us pleasure would no longer bring us anything but distaste and disgust. O oh Lord, that we might be like Your Son, Jesus, and love like Him, and speak truth like Him, and walk sacrificially and humbly like Him. Lord, I pray tonight You would speak through me. And give me Your words, Lord. Lead and guide me. Move me out of the way. And Lord, I want to lift up Wendell and I ask for protection from the enemy. Not only from him, but for all of us, Lord. And that we would remember when we are under attack that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And that if we will trust and stand on your word and believe it, that's all we need. For your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Lord, I want to lift up Michael's friend, Bridget, God, that you would draw her to a closer relationship with you, that you would use Michael in any way to help make that happen. Help him to be the example in her life that brings her under constant conviction of what it means to be a man and a woman of God. Help Michael to model that, Lord. I want to pray for Larry's grandchildren. Lord, that you would convict them to embrace the seeds that have been planted in their lives as children, to be followers of the Lord Jesus, that they wouldn't turn from that, or but they would be convicted that, you know what, I've not been living for God. I've been living for the enemy, and my life is, is a mess right now, and it's because I've rejected those things that my parents have taught me. And Lord, that they would turn from that rebellion and that immaturity and realize that what they're living in is not freedom, it's weakness, it's slavery, and that they would repent. Help Larry to be a model for them, Lord. I want to pray for Ronnie. God, I thank you for his courage to confess his sin before us, Lord. If we would all be that courageous to admit that we are all sinners, none are good, no, not one. We've all lied, we've all lusted, we've all stolen, We've all taken your name in vain. We've all sinned, if not in deed, in word or in thought. So, Ronnie, I thank you for his courage. And, Lord, I do pray that you would deliver him of that addiction. 
Lord, that you would show him how to be so in love with you, so chasing after you, God, that he doesn't have time to do anything else. That his new addiction becomes the Lord Jesus. <laughs> and that he's addicted with spending time with you and praying and reading his Bible and sharing the gospel and witnessing to people. And he just can't get enough. Father, uh, your son said, if you would ask me for a drink, I would give you a drink that would never run dry, but would be in you living water that would spring up wells of eternal life. Lord, give Ronnie an appetite for a new drink, the drink of your spirit that will never run dry. Father, I also want to lift up Willie's daughter, that you protect her. As Larry said, it, it is such a wicked culture. But Lord, I know that wherever the enemy is work, you are much more at work. So Lord, I pray that you would help his daughter to seek you, to know you, and use Willie in any way you see fit to be that example in her life. And that he would be on his knees, as I'm sure he is, every day for her. Lord, I want to pray that you would help Terrence to finish his discipleship class. Lord, I thank you that he's taken the responsibility of doing that. I also want to pray for Dale. God, that you would comfort him. I thank you that he got to spend Thanksgiving with his mother because many people don't get to spend the holidays with their loved ones. And I know that's such a blessing that he will always cherish just as I cherish being able to spend the last few years with my brother before you took him home. God, I'm thankful that I got to know that my brother was going to die and I had that time to prepare. And I'm thankful that Dale knows that his mother is sick and has that time. But Lord, I also know that you're a God of miracles. And Lord, I know that you can heal her or extend that time if you see fit. And so Lord, in Jesus' name, we do ask for her to be healed, for her time to be extended. Lord, I know that we all will have to die eventually at some point. But Lord, an extension of time so that Dale would have more time to just love on his mom. I pray that he would, whether it be through writing a letter, making a phone call, just get everything that's on his heart to say to her out so that he can have the peace knowing that everything he ever wanted to say, he got to say while there was time. Lord, we also want to lift up uh, William's friend Kathy for her alcoholism. God, that you would break those chains of addiction and set her free whom the Son has set free, is free indeed. Lord, that she would know what a real personal relationship with you looks like and embrace it and walk in it. And finally, I uh, lift up David's prayer, which is for everyone else who has not uh, lifted their hand, but Lord, you know their hearts. You know what they're going through. Lord, I just ask that you wrap your loving arms around them. Fill them with your Spirit and have your way with each and every one of them myself included. It's in Jesus' name we ask it all. And everybody said? Amen. 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 I thank you. I know we've uh, spent a good portion of our time in prayer, but you know what? I think it's worth it. I'd much rather just go to the Lord in prayer with y'all's request than just sit up here all night and you listen to me. Uh, having said that, I do feel like I have a word for you. First of all, could I see a show of hands? How many people in here are Christians? Raise them up high. I want to see high now. If you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, okay, most everybody, not everybody, thank you for raising your hands. Now, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes speaking to the couple of people who aren't Christians, and then I'm going to spend the rest of time on family business. For those of you who do not know the Lord Jesus, I know that there can be a, a host of reasons as to why. I talk to many atheists who will say, well, I can't believe in the tooth fairy that you call a god. And then I'll point out to them, but you have no problem believing in the fairy tale that nothing created everything, that non-intelligence created intelligence, that nine life sparked off all life, and that a big chaotic explosion produced functionality and structure and order. I tell them, does it take faith to be a Christian? Yes, but it takes much more to be an atheist, and I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. 
many of them will say, I know that there's a God. I just want to sin. And if that's you, I understand. I've been there. But just know this, you're not promised tomorrow. God has given you tonight, though. And you're here. And it's not by accident. He loves you. And I know if you're honest with yourself, you know. You've told lies. I know I have. You ever taken something that didn't belong to you, even if it was something small? I know I have. You ever looked with lust at a woman? Jesus says, you've, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you even look with lust, you've already done it in your heart. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If we're honest, we all admit it. In fact, the one motto that just about every human being will admit is, hey, I'm just human. No one's perfect, which is a politically correct way of saying, I am evil. I'm a sinner. And I deserve judgment. But here's the thing, God loves you so much that He came, He left heaven, He left perfection, He left worship and praise and the angels and all that to come down here and take on a human body and sweat and get hungry and get stinky and get tired. Jesus Christ, when He left home, was homeless. He says, the, the foxes have a place to lay their head, the Son of Man doesn't. He forsook ever knowing the love of a woman because He had a mission to fulfill that His Father gave Him to do. He never sinned. He was offered all the kingdoms of the world by Satan. Satan said, I could give it all to you, man. You can be the king pimp of the world. Jesus said, nope. I came to die. I came to live for my children. I came to sacrifice myself. I came to do what they cannot. And then Jesus went for people like you and me who would mock him and spit on him, and ridicule him, and torture him. He would say, I'm going to die for them. And after they nailed him to the cross, which it might as well have been you or me nailing him to the cross, because ultimately it's our sin that nailed him there, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. No greater love does a man have than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. Jesus is a friend of sinners. That means you and me. And if you don't know Him for whatever reason, I just pray you'd be honest long enough and humble yourself long enough to admit you've been living it your way, right? You've been doing things apart from God? How's that worked out? How's that going for you? Because I know how it went for me. Horribly. Horribly. So know that He loves you. And know that as long as you draw breath, it's never too late. I used to think, God, I've, I've crossed the line. There's no turning back for me. There's no coming back from this. I swore I'd never do this thing, and now I've done it, and I can never come back from this. You can. The apostle Paul, who was first named Saul, was a murderer of Christians. And he wrote more books in the New Testament than anybody. Can God use you? Yes. Can God redeem you? Yes. When's the last... Who was the last Christian you murdered? Okay? Then you haven't gone as far, far as Paul did. And we see what God did with the Apostle Paul. He can use you, and He wants to use you. He loves you. And a life with Him is real freedom. Okay? Now, I want to talk about a little family business with my brothers in Christ. First, I want to ask a question. We had a lot of hands go up when I asked the question, if you're a Christian. So now here's the question I want to ask. Can somebody tell me what is the gospel? Good news. Good news. That's right. Now, what is that good news? Let me, let me just get a hand raised. I want to hear it definitively from an individual. Jesus saves. Okay. Yes, sir? You have another chance at life. Have chance at life. Yes, sir? <laughs> the truth. The truth. Okay. The now, let me ask you something. If the gospel... Well, let me read you a scripture real quick, and then I'm going to ask you that question. If you have your Bibles and you would like to turn, you can turn to the book of Romans, <coughs> chapter 1.
Verse 16. In fact, could someone, just whoever gets there first, read it out loud. Stand up and read it out loud for us, please. Romans chapter 1, 16. Romans 1, 16. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, sir. So the gospel is the power to save you. It's the power of God to save for all those who believe. So if the gospel is what saves, and we said that the gospel is what? The truth? Right? Now, let me ask you a question. Does Satan know the truth? Is he saved? What did you say it was, sir? No, what did you say the gospel is? Jesus saves. He does. But is that what the gospel is? The words of Christ. Okay. Does the devil know the words of Christ? Is he saved? So, well, that's true. Here's the reason I bring this question up. I realized one day that if someone asked me, Jonathan, what is the gospel? I really didn't know how to answer that. And so I started studying to find out what is the gospel. And as I found it out, I started asking people the question. And here's what I'll get. Uh, the gospel is Jesus loves you. And I'll say, well, he does. But doesn't he love everybody? Well, yes. Is everybody going to heaven? Well, no. So is his love in and of itself what saves? Well, I guess not. Okay, so then that's not the gospel, because what we just read in Romans says the gospel is the power of God to save. So if the gospel is what saves you, and we know that Jesus loves everybody, but not everybody's being saved, then that can't exactly be it. Yes, sir? Well, if God's speaking, the, uh, spreading the good news, mm -hmm. which is the truth, is that the gospel? Well, I would say it's... In a sense, it's part, but it's not the full thing. In a sense, it's part, but not a truth. Correct. I mean, it, 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 will it be good news of gospel or bad news of gospel? Well, in between, it, let me put it to you like this. Okay. Is it true that that wall is light blue? No, oh, we ain't going on The point is, is just because something's true and it's a true statement doesn't mean that that particular statement or message has the power to save you. I don't think that fits in with with the gospel. The gospel stands mm -hmm. up under the word of God right. and the ungodly word of God. Because gospel now is spread where it's an ungodly now in right. to a degree. All right. First of all, the gospel should stand on. Oh, it stands. It stands. I think if I'm not mistaken. First of all, let me, let me just show you guys something. I hope I see you guys are thinking, and that's good. We want to get the wheels turning, okay? It got me thinking. Um, let me just say a couple more things, then we're going to go to this scripture, but if you want to go ahead and be looking for it, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. That's where we're going to go next. So I would ask somebody, what's the gospel? And they would say, uh, Jesus died for my sins. I say, okay, but if he didn't raise from the dead, is that enough to save you? Is it? Is Jesus just dying on the cross enough to save you if he didn't rise from the dead? Paul said, if Christ has not risen from the dead, our faith is in vain. Okay? So my point is, is I've got a room full of men who just raised their hands and said, I know what the gospel is. I'm a Christian, right? And I've asked, and no one has given me a full-fledged answer as to what the gospel is yet. Yes, sir. All right, come on. To sit at the right hand of the Father, so uh, that His Amen. blood washes us and purifies us unto it, and the cross gives us a new life. There we go. And, and we were sent the seal, promise of God, the Holy Spirit, which lives in my spirit, the yep. indwelling of the Spirit. Yeah. The gift, the gift. Yeah. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, meekness, and self-control, yeah. yeah. and the outpouring is the gift of God. Come on. That I have the power unto salvation. That's it. Now he hit it on the head. That's good news. Isn't that it? it is great news. That's the truth, isn't it, it is. Okay. <laughs> but there are a lot of truths that don't save. And that's all I was trying to point out to you. 
So what, what he just said is absolutely correct. It's Christ crucified. He died on the cross for our sins, but he also rose from the dead, defeating Satan, sin, and death. Then he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and then he sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, right? So the reason I ask you what is the gospel is because I know a lot of people, myself it was one included, who would say, oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, I believe the gospel. I'm saved. But if someone were to point a gun to my head and say, what is the gospel? I couldn't really answer them. <laughs> which poses a real big problem when it's the gospel that saves, and yet I claim to be saved and I can't even articulate what it is that's saving me. And beyond that, if you would turn to, I know I said we we're going to go to Matthew 4.23, so let's do that real quick first. Matthew 4.23, and then I'll get back to where I just was. First of all, I want to show you that really when we ask the question, what is the gospel, the, the correct res response would be, which gospel are you talking about? Because the Bible doesn't just teach one gospel. And I'm going to show you just one example of that right now. If someone would read aloud uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, please. Matthew chapter 4. Thank you. Preaching the gospel or the good news of the kingdom. So there is a gospel of Jesus Christ that saves us, but there's also a gospel of the kingdom. And if you actually go and read the gospels, you're going to be amazed at how many times you find the gospel of the kingdom being talked about. All right? And then he'll say the kingdom's like a mustard seed, right? And, and let me tell you the good news about the kingdom. And he has all these parables about the kingdom. Why is that important? Well, because the Jews were expecting not only a new king, but a new kingdom. And he's basically saying, I'm it. And here it is, both. Now, many people will say the kingdom is yet future. The heavenly kingdom has not yet come. We're, we haven't seen the new kingdom yet. To which I would say, the kingdom of God is much like salvation. The Bible talks about the fact that you're saved, but you're also being saved. We call that sanctification. And you will be saved. We call that glorification. So there's a sense in which, a sense in which we are saved, but we're also being saved, and we also will be saved. In the same way, the kingdom works that way. The kingdom began 2,000 years ago. It started with 120 people in the other upper room. Now it's millions. Has the kingdom grown? Is it a kingdom without end? That the gates of hell would not prevail against? I would say certainly so. Because if we look over the last 2,000 years, has the kingdom of hell been trying to defeat it? Yep. Has it been successful? Nope. Has it continued to grow without end? Yep. But is that all of the kingdom? No. There's still a kingdom to come as well. But I just want to point out to you that when we, when we talk about this, this thing, the gospel... Um, many of us just haven't really studied the Bible in, enough to realize that there's a lot that talks about the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God, the gospel of the kingdom. There's a lot of different gospels it's talking about. Um, and so, now that I kind of pointed that out to you, um, we know what the gospel is, power of God unto salvation, and we know the message, that message that is the power of God unto salvation, is the, or the work that was done, is the work of Christ living the sinless life we could never live, dying the death that we deserve, raising from the dead, sending to the Father, sending the Holy Spirit. That is the good news. That is the gospel. That is the work that Christ did, and that is the message we are to proclaim. Which brings me to my next point. If you don't know how to articulate what the gospel is, how can you share it? So let's go to Mark chapter 16. <coughs> Verse 15. Who would like to read it for us? Mark, chapter 16, verse 15. You guys awake tonight? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's Jesus speaking. Jesus commands to go and preach the gospel to every creature. So church, 
which is the majority of this room is church. We raised our hands. How's it going? How many people have you been preaching the gospel to this week? Or this month? Yay! Or this month? Or this year? Right? Um, quite honestly, we, we all know that very few Christians do this. And if you're one that does it, praise God. Kudos to you. But very few of us do. Right? So um, here comes that part where I want this to be more than just a message of me talking and you listening. Okay? Um, can we have some honest people that would raise their hands to say, I've not shared with anyone in the last week. I've not shared with anyone in the last month. I've not shared with anyone in the last year. Okay. So here's what I want to ask you guys. If you raise your hand, can you tell me why? Now, many of you may say, because just like you said, Jonathan, I'm not really sure what the gospel is. If someone asked me, I wouldn't know how to articulate it. Well, right on. I'm with you. We've articulated it tonight. And if you don't remember it, I want to challenge you, make it a priority to remember it, to get in the Word of God and study it. If you're staying here, get with this guy right here who articulated it for us earlier and say, hey, man, I want to study with you on what is the gospel. Yeah. It's not us that do the work. It's the Holy Spirit. I agree. Acts 1 and 8 says you shall receive power to be my witnesses. That's right. All throughout the Judea, the Samaria, to the uttermost part. That's right. That's right. Power comes from the power of the Holy Ghost. That's right. That's right. I totally agree. But we are to make disciples and disciple one another. And so I'm asking you to disciple some men that might come to you and say, instruct me. A disciple just means you're a teacher. And all a disciple is is someone who's been walking out the Christian life a little bit longer than you, who is supposed to come alongside you as a brother in Christ and say, hey, man, let me try to help you understand how to walk out this Christian life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. It just seems like I'm being tested. You know, when I'm a grown man, like, you know, somebody want to just treat me and disrespect me like I'm a child. Yeah. I mean, in my walks of life, yeah. since, you know, uh, three months ago yeah. up to now, yeah. you know, it just seems like I'm being totally disrespected. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just seems like, uh, and, and I'm, this is serious yeah. too. When I'm out there in the world, yeah. you know what I'm saying, moving around, yeah. the same thing. Well, it's all petty. well, you know what? You, pr you probably are. You probably are being disrespected, <laughs> just like Jesus was, just like the apostles were, right? And, 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 I'm, and every time I, and I'm being humble. That's it. Because, because I was wild at one point in my life, real wild, yeah. and, and didn't care yeah. about hurting anybody yeah. or harming anybody. But it seemed like as soon as I become yeah. humble and submissive to yeah. the Creator, yeah. It just seemed like somebody at me. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to respond to that, but I want to get this gentle. I totally understand. I'm going to respond to that, but let me get this gentleman's comment. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree, but here's, here's, here's a secret that I have learned, okay? And I don't, pro I, I don't proclaim to have this perfectly down myself. I still struggle to do this sometimes, but here's the key, okay? If we are really in love with Jesus, and He's what we're living for, and He's all we care about, circumstances should not have power over us. People and how they treat us or how they talk to us should not have power over us. Now, I want to point this out to you in Scripture. This is one of my favorite stories of all time, and it's funny that you brought this up because I already had it on my card to bring up. Acts chapter 16, if you would turn there with me, if you have your Bible, if you can. I love this story, and this is probably where we're going to end tonight after this. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. Now, this is just to give you a little context. This is the Apostle Paul after he's you know, become a Christian and he's out sharing the gospel. And another brother in Christ, Silas. Okay? 
Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying these men are the servants of the most high god who proclaim to us the way of salvation i got to park there just real quick two things i want you to notice number 1 this girl who's possessed with a demonic spirit okay has no problem, these demons through her have no problem proclaiming Christ as Christ. Out loud, in public. And yet many of us are cowards to do it. I did a message one time on how can I fall more in love with God? And what God showed me is, is your problem isn't um, to try to get more emotional or this or that. Your problem is you don't truly appreciate what I've already done for you. Because, you know, if you really loved and cared, I mean, because here's what God showed me. Look, even the demons will do it. Okay? But they don't love me. But they'll go, you're the servant of the Most High God! Out loud, in public, through this woman. And how many of us are afraid to even pray in public at a restaurant? The question is, is, you know, how much do we really believe this stuff? How much do we really love God? But the other thing I want to point out to you is it, it starts off in verse 16, as it happened, as we went to prayer. In other words, the moment Paul and Silas began devoting themselves to prayer, what came? The devil, the devil in this woman. Okay? Let's continue on. Verse 18. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, Turn and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Now, picture this. You and your Christian brother are in a public place. Let's say you're at the Wolf Chase Galleria Mall. Tons of people around. Got drugged to the, drugged to the marketplace. Now, I want you to picture you being one of these guys. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes. So I want you to imagine being a wolf chase mall and being stripped naked in public. Then tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Now I want you to imagine them picking up some two by fours and starting to whack you like whack a mole upside the head with a two by four while you're stripped butt naked at the Wolf Chase Mall. And all this because you're being obedient, because you're doing the will of it, not because you did something wrong, but because you're doing the right thing. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Many of us are not being persecuted because we're not walking in faith. <clears throat> Verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them in prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received, received such a charge or command, he put them in the inner dungeon and fastened their feet in stocks. Now I want you to imagine this. 2,000 years ago, no heater, no air conditioning. They put you in the inner dungeon, which means probably no bars, so no airflow, okay? No light, no fresh air. Um, unless they had some candles lit or some oil lamps lit, you are in utter pitch black darkness. It's either probably freezing or pretty hot down there in that thing, being like in a cellar, okay? You're probably sitting on a floor that's either made of dirt, mud, or stone. You're butt naked, you're bleeding, you're bruised, and now they've locked you, your feet in these stocks where you can't move. You ever been stuck in a position for a long time where you start cramping up yeah. and you're like hurting really bad? Now imagine this is you. How are you feeling? Do you have the joy of the Lord? Or are you angry? Are you crying? Are you yelling? Are you mad? 
Now, let's go take a lesson from Paul and Silas. Put them in, in a prison, fasten their feet in stocks, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were singing praises and hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. My friends, that is power. That is power. When nothing a man can say or do to you that will sway you. When nothing a man or can do or say to you or no circumstance that this world can bring your way can move you or touch you. That's walking in freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, but how many of us walk that way? You can have a peace that passes understanding in Christ Jesus, but many of us have no peace. I talked about this last week for a minute. Why is it? Well, I'm a Christian, I believe. Well, James says, even the demons believe and they tremble. There's a kind of faith that saves and a kind that doesn't. There's a kind that's living and there's a kind that's dead. Which do you possess? I can tell you the kind that Paul and Silas possessed. A living faith. A faith that moved them not only to act, not only to share that gospel, overcoming all fear and worry because they didn't care about anything anymore but just to live as Christ, right? To die as gain. That's it. That's all they care about. And they had peace that passes understanding. They had faith that could move mountains. Because you want to see what happens next? Or cause earthquakes. <laughs> Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and every, everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposed the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice saying, Do no harm to yourself for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, when you're going through these trials, the enemy's attacking you. You're trying to be humble and sweet and loving, and people are mocking you, taking advantage of that you, and you're letting that hurt you. I want you to think about this. Why are you getting upset that godless people are acting ungodly? Isn't that what you would expect them to do? That would be like me inviting a blind person into my home. I know that they're blind. And they come in and they start knocking stuff over. And I start getting mad. Going, what the heck are you doing, dude? Put on some glasses. That's wrong. You're offending me. No, that would be ridiculous of me. Why? Because they're blind. If anything, me knowing that I have sight and they don't. I should say, come here, friend. Let me help you. Right? And when they do knock something over, I don't take it personal. They're blind. What else would I expect from a blind person? See, if we really only care about pleasing the Lord and our focus is on Him, what people say or do or how they treat us doesn't matter. You know, tonight there are people, people in this room who would say, man, I like that Jonathan guy. You know, he seems like a really nice guy. There are other people in here who are like, I hate that idiot. I wish he'd shut up. <laughs> but you know what? I got joy either way. It don't matter. Amen. Why? Because I know I'm pleasing to my father. There you go. Amen. And that's how you need to walk, brother. Don't worry. It is hard sometimes, but we have to continue to get our eyes back on Jesus. We have to continue to get our eyes back on the prize and refocus ourselves on what, what is it all for? What am I doing this for? What's, what's the Christian life all about? Living for Him, knowing Him, loving Him. And when I serve people, I'm not doing it to get their affection, their attention, their love, or their approval. I'm not doing it to get their kudos or their, you know, man, thank you so much. No. I'm doing it for one reason. Because I love him. And so I'm going to help you. And if you treat me great, right on. Praise God. I'm going to love you. You treat me like crap, 
Lord, are you pleased you are? Praise God. I'm still happy. It don't matter. Amen. It don't matter. And I'm not going to take it personal because I realize the reason people are mean to me is because they're broken. Right? They're broken. Whenever someone is mean to you, I want you to immediately remind yourself of this. They're broken. It's nothing personal. They just don't get it because they're broken. Just like you were. Just like I was. And when you see them with those eyes, you're not going to be offended. You're going to feel sorry for them. You're not going to be offended by them. Your heart is going to break for them. That's right. And you're going to have a whole new power and perspective like Paul and Silas had. That's where right. all of a sudden now people can't move you. Because it's not about them. Because it's not about you. It's all about the king, man. That's right? right? Amen. And you start to just walk in victory, man, because you're, you're dead to you. There is no you. Your name Willie? Willard. Willard. Wendell. 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 There is no Wendell. Wendell who? Right? Hey, man, uh, Billy Bob just offended you, Wendell. Wendell's dead. Who are you talking about? There ain't no Wendell here. There's only Jesus here. And Jesus don't get offended because Jesus died for him. Jesus said from the cross, after they just got through nailing him to it, forgive him. Amen. And we're to be like him. Now, that does not mean that you have to be a doormat for everyone who wants to take advantage of you or use you or enable people. Don't become an enabler. Some people you have to love from a distance, okay? Just because we want to be like Christ to them does not mean we give them a license to just take everything they want. Even Jesus would put limits on things. Right. Hey, I'm going to give you all this bread and food. I go to the next city. Hey, Jesus, where's more bread and food? We'll believe if you give us more bread and food. No, you won't. <laughs> and I'm not going to give you more bread and food. Right? <laughs> There's a time when we can put on the limit and say, I love you. I'm going to pray for you. But I ain't letting you in my house. Right? <laughs> I love you, I'll, pray, I'll buy you lunch, but I ain't handing you cash. There ain't nothing wrong with that, from my perspective. Now, if you can find somewhere in the Bible where it says different, go with what the Bible says. But yeah, don't let people offend you, man. And I know it's hard. I still fall, fall short in that often. But I have to keep getting my eyes back on the prize, right? It's like Peter. Jesus, if that's you on the water, command me to come to you. Jesus says, come. And Peter begins to do the impossible, man. <laughs> He's walking on the water. He's defying gravity. Until what? He starts to pay attention to the chaos, the clatter, the waves, the people, the drama around him. And he gets his eyes off the king. He gets his eyes off the solution and he gets his eyes onto the problem. Are you focused on the problem or the solution? The devil is at work, to be sure. But who's much more at work? The devil is strong, to be sure. But who's greater? He who lives in me. It's, it's, what, are you, what, are you, what is your perspective? Right? So I'm not asking you, uh, a good, good, great book I want to recommend to you is Philippians. It's real short, four chapters. It's Paul in prison. And he writes this encouraging letter, right, about how, man, I'm in prison. And ever since I've been here, the entire Imperial Guard has been made aware of Jesus Christ and everyone else as well. And now that you guys have heard about my imprisonment and you see how the Lord's been at work in it, you become much more em emboldened and, and courageous to go out and share the gospel, which means obviously they weren't before. And Paul just keeps going on and on about all this great stuff that's happening in this hellhole. Why? Because he has a kingdom perspective. And he's not deluding himself. He's not like in fairy tale land going, oh, look at this beautiful place I'm in. It's so wonderful. Look at the Gothic architecture. I, I love this place. He's not like kidding himself. He knows he's in a crappy place. He never claims that the prison is a nice place. He just chooses to focus on how God is at work and what God is going to do through this difficult thing or this trial or this circumstance instead of focusing on the enemy. He could have said, man, this place sucks. It's unfair. I shouldn't be here. This is not right. God, I was doing the right thing and you allowed this to happen. But he doesn't. No, 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 no. God's in control. He works all things together for my good because I love him. That's what the word says. I'm, I'm sticking to it. 
So I'm in prison. I was doing the right thing. I'm not here because I did some sin or I did something bad, but God has allowed it. So there must be a purpose in it. So I'm going to find that purpose. And I know what it is. I'm going to share the gospel with all these people. You know, these Roman guards, they wouldn't even listen to me or give me the time of day before, but now they have to listen to me because they got to guard me. And some of these Roman guards have access to people in high places within the Roman society that I could never get to. But because I'm in here and now they have to listen to me and I've told them and now they're starting to get worked on by the Holy Spirit and now they can go back to their superiors and, and get in their ear what I couldn't have. See, he starts, he's kingdom minded, man. Everything he's doing is with his eyes on the king and his eyes on the kingdom. So everything he goes through, it's always with a kingdom perspective. And because of that, he just sees things totally different. Things don't get him upset. You know, we'll be like, ah, oh, I'm in prison. This sucks. This is unfair. Da, da, da. Paul's like, man, this is great. I'm in prison. I'm sharing the gospel with everybody. All my brothers and sisters are now getting bold and, 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 and courageous to go out and do the same thing. And then they say, you know, he points out in Philippians that some of his opponents, some false teachers, are out there preaching the gospel with vain motives, with ambitions, okay, they want to be the head pastor, right? They want to be the next Joel Osteen. They want to be the head dude in charge, not Paul, okay? And Paul is like, you know what? They're going out here, and they're using my imprisonment as an opportunity to talk bad about me, to probably to try to steal his crowd, right? To slander his name. And you got to think, Paul has worked years and years, given his life to build these churches and in these people, and he could be saying, man, these God, these people are undoing everything I've worked so hard for. This is not fair. This is not right. Does he say that? No. You know what he says? Hey, you know what? I know they're false teachers, and I know that they're doing it with vain ambition, and they're trying to undercut me and undermine me and take advantage of me, but you know what? They're preaching the gospel. So people are still getting saved. And in that, I rejoice. Yes, I rejoice, baby. Why? Because it's not about him. It's not about Paul. Paul who? It's about the king, man. And the gospel's getting preached. People are getting saved. Who cares about me? They weren't my people in the first place. They're his. It's not my name that I need to worry about being drugged through the mud because it's not about me. Who cares about my name? I have no reputation. Paul said everything he had, he counted as dung, as crap. Okay? Problem is we're selfish. We get focused on us, our feelings, what we deserve, what we're entitled to. That's not fair. You shouldn't do me that way. How could you? How dare you? And Jesus would say, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He had more right than anybody to complain, and yet he didn't. We just got to die to ourselves, and yeah, it's hard, brother. It's hard to do it, Wendell, but it's worth it. It's worth it. It's the only way, man. Amen. That freedom. See, that's what I'm, I'm trying to get to that place that Paul got to and Silas got to. To where no matter the circumstance, no matter what someone says or does, I'm so kingdom-minded, man. I'm so about the king that nothing can faze me. That's my dream. That's my goal. That's where I want to get. Like Jesus. And I pray that that's your dream too. I'm going to leave you with a, a closing scripture. In Philippians chapter 4, one of my favorite books of the Bible. And this is one of those scriptures that should encourage you and should hopefully help you to keep this perspective. Again, is there a devil? Yeah, absolutely. Is he at work? Sure. Do we need to pray for protection? Jesus said we should. When the disciples said, you Jesus, how should we pray? Right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And you keep going and it says, um, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one or from evil, depending on your translation. Right? So Jesus obviously said, hey, pray for protection. Pray for deliverance from the evil one. So should we pray for protection? Yeah, absolutely. Right? right? But should we stop there? No. So let's read Philippians chapter 4. Now remember, this is Paul in prison. Okay. Hmm. 
We'll start verse 3. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Where is he saying this from? Prison. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Talking about trying to be humble and gentle, right? <coughs> Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious or worryful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, well, that would be requests, and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So what, is, what did Paul just say? Don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry about it. Just pray about it. Trust the Lord. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Your thinking and your emotion. Your feelings. Right? Because if you pray and you know that God is good and He's a loving daddy, works all things together for your good and His glory, and you know He's ultimately in control and He's going to take care of you, then you go, huh, I don't have to worry. You've got this, God. And as you believe in that, you're going to have peace. If you're walking in Christ, if you're abiding in Christ, it's a daily thing. It's not a one and done deal. It's a continual process we do to abide in Christ. Have that relationship. Verse 8. Now here's, here's the one I really wanted to get you to. Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on. Another way of saying it is think about. Another way of saying it is focus on these things. Does it say when you're being attacked, focus on what the enemy is doing? Is that what it says, Wendell? Is that what it says? Whenever you're being attacked by the enemy, focus on the enemy. Is that what it says? Is that what it, I just said? Do I need to read it for you again? Let me read it for you again. Finally, brothers, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Whatever is true, whatever is noble or just or pure or lovely, or if it has anything of a good report or virtue, or if there's anything praiseworthy about it, Meditate on, focus on, think about these things. That's the gospel. Okay, so Wendell, I'm going to ask you again. If the devil's messing with you, are you supposed to focus on the devil's messing with me? And what it says right there, is focus on the good stuff. Okay? That's the short version. Whatever's true, lovely, good report, excellent, focus on that good stuff. Okay? Yeah, the devil's at work. Yeah, there's problems. Okay? Focus on where God is at work. Focus on the blessings. Yeah, the devil's powerful. Focus on greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. Amen. Right? Okay. Amen. Guys, bow your heads and we'll go to Lord in prayer and let you get out of here. Lord, I thank you so much for tonight. And this privilege and honor to speak to my brothers. Lord, I pray that um, you touched hearts tonight and Holy Spirit, that you would have your way with each and every one of us. Forgive me for going over in time. I hope David and them aren't too mad at me. But Lord, I pray that um, you had your way tonight. Be with these men. Go with them this week. And bring each of us closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. God bless you, my man. God bless you.